Chapter thirty eight of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty eight. A dissolution of partnership. I did not allow my resolution with respect to the parliamentary debates to cool. It was one of the irons I began to heat immediately, and one of the irons I kept hot and hammered at with a perseverance I may honestly admire. I bought an approved scheme of the noble art and mystery of stenography, which cost me ten and sixpence, and plunged into a sea of perplexity that brought me, in a few weeks, to the confines of distraction. The changes that were rung upon dots which in such a position meant such a thing, and in such another position something else, entirely different, the wonderful vagaries that were played by circles, the unaccountable consequences that resulted from marks like flies' legs, the tremendous effects of a curve in a wrong place, not only troubled my waking hours, but reappeared before me in my sleep. When I had groped my way blindly through these difficulties, and had mastered the alphabet, which was an Egyptian temple in itself, there then appeared a procession of new horrors, called arbitrary characters, the most despotic characters I have ever known, who insisted, for instance, that a thing like the beginning of a cobweb meant expectation, that a pen and ink skyrocket stood for disadvantageous. When I had fixed these wretches in my mind, I found that they had driven everything else out of it. Then, beginning again, I forgot them. While I was picking them up, I dropped the other fragments of the system. In short, it was almost heartbreaking. It might have been quite heartbreaking, but for Dora, who was the stay and anchor of my tempest-driven bark. Every scratch in the scheme was a gnarled oak in the forest of difficulty, and I went on cutting them down one after another, with such vigour that in three or four months I was in a condition to make an experiment on one of our crack speakers in the Commons. I shall never forget how the crack speaker walked off from me before I began, and left my imbecile pencil staggering about the paper as if it were in a fit. This would not do, it was quite clear. I was flying too high and should never get on so. I resorted to Traddles for advice, who suggested that he should dictate speeches to me, at a pace and with occasional stoppages adapted to my weakness. Very grateful for this friendly aid, I accepted the proposal, and night after night, almost every night for a long time, we had a sort of private parliament in Buckingham Street, after I came home from the doctor's. I should like to see such a parliament anywhere else. My aunt and Mr. Dick represented the government, or the opposition, as the case might be, and Traddles, with the assistance of Enfield speakers, or a volume of parliamentary orations, thundered astonishing invectives against them. Standing by the table with his finger in the page to keep the place, and his right arm flourishing above his head, Traddles, as Mr. Pitt, Mr. Fox, Mr. Sheridan, Mr. Burke, Lord Castlereagh, Viscount Sidmouth, or Mr. Canning, would work himself into the most violent heats, and deliver the most withering denunciations of the profligacy and corruption of my aunt and Mr. Dick, while I used to sit at a little distance with my notebook on my knee, fagging after him with all my might and main. The inconsistency and recklessness of Traddles were not to be exceeded by any real politician. He was for any description of policy, in the compass of a week, and nailed all sorts of colours to every denomination of mast. My aunt, looking very like an immovable Chancellor of the Exchequer, would occasionally throw in an interruption or two, as, Here, or No, or Oh, when the text seemed to require it which was always a signal to Mr. Dick, a perfect country gentleman, to follow lustily with the same cry. But Mr. Dick got taxed with such things in the course of his parliamentary career, and was made responsible for such awful consequences, that he became uncomfortable in his mind sometimes. I believe he actually began to be afraid he really had been doing something, tending to the annihilation of the British constitution and the ruin of the country. Often and often we pursued these debates until the clock pointed to midnight, and the candles were burning down. The result of so much good practice was that, by and by, I began to keep pace with Traddles pretty well, and should have been quite triumphant if I had had the least idea what my notes were about. But as to reading them after I had got them, I might as well have copied the Chinese inscriptions of an immense collection of tea-chests, or the golden characters on all the great red and green bottles in the chemist's shops. There was nothing for it but to turn back and begin all over again. 
It was very hard, but I turned back, though with a heavy heart, and began laboriously and methodically to plod over the same tedious ground at a snail's pace, stopping to examine minutely every speck on the way, on all sides, and making the most desperate efforts to know these elusive characters by sight wherever I met them. I was always punctual at the office, at the doctor's too, and I really did work, as the common expression is, like a cart-horse. One day when I went to the commons, as usual, I found Mr. Spenlow in the doorway looking extremely grave, and talking to himself. As he was in the habit of complaining of pains in his head, he had naturally a short throat, and I do seriously believe he overstarched himself. I was at first alarmed by the idea that he was not quite right in that direction, but he soon relieved my uneasiness. Instead of returning my good morning with his usual affability, he looked at me in a distant ceremonious manner, and coldly requested me to accompany him to a certain coffee-house, which in those days had a door opening into the commons, just within the little archway in St. Paul's churchyard. I complied in a very uncomfortable state, and with a warm shooting all over me, as if my apprehensions were breaking out into buds. When I allowed him to go on a little before, on account of the narrowness of the way, I observed that he carried his head with a lofty air that was particularly unpromising, and my mind misgave me that he had found out about my darling Dora. If I had not guessed this on the way to the coffee-house, I could hardly have failed to know what was the matter when I followed him into an upstairs room, and found Miss Murdstone there, supported by a background of sideboard on which were several inverted tumblers sustaining lemons, and two of those extraordinary boxes, all corners and flutings, for sticking knives and forks in, which, happily for mankind, are now obsolete. Miss Murdstone gave me her chilly finger-nails, and sat severely rigid. Mr. Spenlow shut the door, motioned me into a chair, and stood on the hearth-rug in front of the fireplace. I "'Have the goodness to show Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow, "'what you have in your reticule, Miss Murdstone.' I believe it was the old identical steel-clasped reticule of my childhood that shut up like a bite. Compressing her lips in sympathy with a snap, Miss Murdstone opened it, opening her mouth a little at the same time, and produced my last letter to Dora teeming with expressions of devoted affection. "'I believe that is your writing, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow. I was very hot, and the voice I heard was very unlike mine when I said, "'It is, sir.' "'If I am not mistaken,' said Mr. Spenlow, as Miss Murdstone brought a parcel of letters out of her reticule, tied round with the dearest bit of blue ribbon, "'those are also from your pen, Mr. Copperfield.' I took them from her with a most desolate sensation, and, glancing at such phrases at the top as, My ever dearest and own Dora, my best beloved angel, my blessed one for ever, and the like, blushed deeply and inclined my head. No, thank you, said Mr. Spenlow coldly as I mechanically offered them back to him. I will not deprive you of them. Miss Murdstone, be so good as to proceed. That gentle creature, after a moment's thoughtful survey of the carpet, delivered herself with much dry unction as follows. I must confess to having entertained my suspicions of Miss Spenlow in reference to David Copperfield for some time. I observed Miss Spenlow and David Copperfield when they first met, and the impression made upon me then was not agreeable. The depravity of the human heart is such— You will oblige me, ma'am, interrupted Mr. Spenlow, by confining yourself to facts. Miss Murdstone cast down her eyes, shook her head as if protesting against this unseemly interruption, and with frowning dignity resumed, "'Since I am to confine myself to facts, I will state them as dryly as I can. Perhaps that will be considered an acceptable course of proceeding. As I have already said, sir, that I have had my suspicions of Miss Spenlow in reference to David Copperfield for some time. I have frequently endeavoured to find decisive corroboration of those suspicions, but without effect.' I have therefore forborne to mention them to Miss Spenlow's father, looking severely at him, knowing how little disposition there usually is in such cases, to acknowledge the conscientious discharge of duty. Mr. Spenlow seemed quite cowed by the gentlemanly sternness of Miss Murdstone's manner, and deprecated her severity with a conciliatory little wave of his hand. "'On my return to Norwood, after the period of absence occasioned by my brother's marriage,' pursued Miss Murdstone in a disdainful voice, and on the return of Miss Spenlow from her visit to her friend Miss Mills, I imagine that the manner of Miss Spenlow gave me greater occasion for suspicion than before. Therefore I watched Miss Spenlow closely. 
dear tender little dora so unconscious of this dragon's eye still resumed miss murdstone i found no proof until last night it appeared to me that miss spenlow received too many letters from her friend miss mills but miss mills being her friend with her father's full concurrence another telling blow at mr spenlow it was not for me to interfere if i may not be permitted to allude to the natural depravity of the human heart at least i may i must be permitted so far to refer to misplaced confidence mr spenlow apologetically murmured his assent last evening after tea pursued miss murdstone i observed the little dog starting rolling and growling about the drawing-room worrying something i said to miss spenlow dora what is that the dog has in his mouth it's paper miss spenlow immediately put her hand to her frock gave a sudden cry and ran to the dog i interposed and said dora my love you must permit me oh jip miserable spaniel this wretchedness then was your work miss spenlow endeavoured said miss murdstone to bribe me with kisses work-boxes and small articles of jewellery that of course i pass over the little dog retreated under the sofa on my approaching him and was with great difficulty dislodged by the fire-irons even when dislodged he still kept the letter in his mouth and on my endeavouring to take it from him at the imminent risk of being bitten he kept it between his teeth so pertinaciously as to suffer himself to be held suspended in the air by means of the document at length i obtained possession of it after perusing it i taxed miss spenlow with having many such letters in her possession and ultimately obtained from her the packet which is now in david copperfield's hand here she ceased and snapping her reticule again and shutting her mouth looked as if she might be broken but could never be bent you have heard miss murdstone said mr spenlow turning to me i beg to ask mr copperfield if you have anything to say in reply the picture i had before me of the beautiful little treasure of my heart sobbing and crying all night of her being alone frightened and wretched then of her having so piteously begged and prayed that stony-hearted woman to forgive her of having vainly offered her those kisses work-boxes and trinkets of her being in such grievous distress and all for me very much impaired the little dignity i had been able to muster i am afraid i was in a tremulous state for a minute or so though i did my best to disguise it there is nothing to say sir i returned except that all the blame is mine dora miss spenlow if you please said her father majestically was induced and persuaded by me i went on swallowing that colder designation to consent to this concealment and i bitterly regret it you are very much to blame sir said mr spenlow walking to and fro upon the hearth-rug and emphasizing what he said with his whole body instead of his head on account of the stiffness of his cravat and spine you have done a stealthy and unbecoming action mr copperfield when i take a gentleman to my house no matter whether he is nineteen twenty-nine or ninety i take him there in a spirit of confidence if he abuses my confidence he commits a dishonourable action mr copperfield i feel it sir i assure you i returned but i never thought so before sincerely honestly indeed mr spenlow i never thought so before i love miss spenlow to that extent pooh nonsense said mr spenlow reddening pray don't tell me to my face that you love my daughter mr copperfield could i defend my conduct if i did not sir i returned with all humility can you defend your conduct if you do sir said mr spenlow stopping short upon the hearth-rug have you considered your years and my daughter's years mr copperfield have you considered what it is to undermine the confidence that should subsist between my daughter and myself have you considered my daughter's station in life the projects i may contemplate for her advancement the testamentary intentions i may have with reference to her have you considered anything mr copperfield very little sir i am afraid i answered speaking to him as respectfully and sorrowfully as i felt but pray believe me i have considered my own worldly position when i explained it to you we were already engaged i beg said mr spenlow more like punch than i had ever seen him as he energetically struck one hand upon the other i could not help noticing that even in my despair that you will not talk to me of engagements mr copperfield the otherwise immovable miss murdstone laughed contemptuously in one short syllable 
when i explained my altered position to you sir i began again substituting a new form of expression for what was so unpalatable to him this concealment into which i am so unhappy as to have led miss spenlow had begun since i have been in that altered position i have strained every nerve i have exerted every energy to improve it i am sure i shall improve it in time will you grant me time any length of time we are both so young sir you are right interrupted mr spenlow nodding his head a great many times and frowning very much you are both very young it's all nonsense let there be an end of the nonsense take away those letters and throw them in the fire give me miss spenlow's letters to throw in the fire and although our future intercourse must you are aware be restricted to the commons here we will agree to make no further mention of the past come mr copperfield you don't want sense and this is the sensible course no i couldn't think of agreeing to it i was very sorry but there was a higher consideration than sense love was above all earthly considerations and i loved dora to idolatry and dora loved me i didn't exactly say so i softened it down as much as i could but i implied it and i was resolute upon it i don't think i made myself very ridiculous but i know i was resolute very well mr copperfield said mr spenlow i must try my influence with my daughter Miss Murdstone, by an expressive sound, a long-drawn respiration, which was neither a sigh nor a moan, but it was like both, gave it as her opinion that he should have done this at first. "'I must try,' said Mr. Spenlow, confirmed by this support, "'my influence with my daughter. Do you decline to take those letters, Mr. Copperfield?' for i had laid them on the table yes i told him i hoped he would not think it wrong but i couldn't possibly take them from miss murdstone nor from me said mr spenlow no i replied with the profoundest respect nor from him very well said mr spenlow a silence succeeding i was undecided whether to go or stay at length i was moving quietly towards the door with the intention of saying that perhaps i should consult his feelings best by withdrawing when he said with his hands in his coat pockets into which it was as much as he could do to get them and with what i should call upon the whole a decidedly pious air you are probably aware mr copperfield that i am not altogether destitute of worldly possessions and that my daughter is my nearest and dearest relative i hurriedly made him a reply to the effect that i hoped the error into which i had been betrayed by the desperate nature of my love did not induce him to think me mercenary too I don't allude to the matter in that light, said Mr. Spenlow. It would be better for yourself and all of us if you were mercenary, Mr. Copperfield. I mean, if you were more discreet and less influenced by all this youthful nonsense. No, I merely say, with quite another view, you are probably aware that I have some property to bequeath to my child. I certainly suppose so. And you can hardly think, said Mr. Spenlow, having experience of what we see in the commons here every day, of the various unaccountable and negligent proceedings of men, in respect of their testamentary arrangements, of all subjects, the one on which perhaps the strangest revelations of human inconsistency are to be met with, but that mine are made. I inclined my head in acquiescence. I should not allow, said Mr. Spenlow, with an evident increase of pious sentiment, and slowly shaking his head as he poised himself upon his toes and heels alternately, by suitable provision for my child to be influenced by a piece of youthful folly like the present. It is mere folly, mere nonsense. In a little while it will weigh lighter than a feather. But I might, I might, if this silly business were not completely relinquished altogether, be induced in some anxious moment to guard her from, and surround her with protections against, the consequences of any foolish step in the way of marriage. Now, Mr. Copperfield, I hope that you will not render it necessary for me to open, even for a quarter of an hour, that closed page in the book of life, and unsettle, even for a quarter of an hour, grave affairs long since composed." There was a serenity, a tranquillity, a calm sunset air about him, which quite affected me. He was so peaceful and resigned, clearly had his affairs in such perfect train, and so systematically wound up, that he was a man to feel touched in the contemplation of. I really think I saw tears rise to his eyes, from the depth of his own feeling of all this. But what could I do? I could not deny Dora and my own heart. When he told me I had better take a week to consider of what he had said, how could I say I wouldn't take a week, yet how could I fail to know that no amount of weeks could influence such love as mine? 
"'In the meantime, confer with Miss Trotwood, or with any person with any knowledge of life,' said Mr. Spenlow, adjusting his cravat with both hands. "'Take a week, Mr. Copperfield.' I submitted, and with a countenance as expressive as I was able to make it of dejected and despairing constancy, came out of the room. Miss Murdstone's heavy eyebrows followed me to the door. I say her eyebrows rather than her eyes, because they were much more important in her face, and she looked so exactly as she used to look, at about that hour of the morning, in our parlour at Blunderstone, that I could have fancied I had been breaking down in my lessons again, and that the dead weight on my mind was that horrible old spelling-book, with oval woodcuts shaped to my youthful fancy, like the glasses out of spectacles. When I got to the office, and shutting out old Tiffy and the rest of them with my hands, sat at my desk in my own particular nook, thinking of this earthquake that had taken place so unexpectedly, and in the bitterness of my spirit cursing Jip, I fell into such a state of torment about Dora, that I wonder I did not take up my hat and rush insanely to Norwood the idea of their frightening her and making her cry and of my not being there to comfort her was so excruciating that it impelled me to write a wild letter to mr spenlow beseeching him not to visit upon her the consequences of my awful destiny i implored him to spare her gentle nature not to crush a fragile flower and addressed him generally to the best of my remembrance as if instead of being her father he had been an ogre or the dragon of wantley this letter i sealed and laid upon his desk before he returned and when he came in i saw him through the half-open door of his room take it up and read it he said nothing about it all morning but before he went away in the afternoon he called me in and told me that i need not make myself at all uneasy about his daughter's happiness he had assured her he said that it was all nonsense and he had nothing more to say to her he believed he was an indulgent father as indeed he was and I might spare myself any solicitude on her account. "'You may make it necessary, if you are foolish or obstinate, Mr. Copperfield,' he observed, "'for me to send my daughter abroad again for a term. But I have a better opinion of you. I hope you will be wiser than that in a few days. As to Miss Murdstone, for I had alluded to her in the letter, I respect that lady's vigilance, and feel obliged to her. But she has a strict charge to avoid the subject.' All I desire, Mr. Copperfield, is that it should be forgotten. All you have got to do, Mr. Copperfield, is to forget it. All. In the note I wrote to Miss Mills, I bitterly quoted this sentiment. All I had to do, I said, with a gloomy sarcasm, was to forget Dora. That was all. And what was that? I entreated Miss Mills to see me that evening. If it could not be done with Mr. Mills's sanction and concurrence, I besought a clandestine interview in the back kitchen where the mangle was. I informed her that my reason was tottering on its throne, and only she, Miss Mills, could prevent its being deposed. I signed myself, hers distractedly, and I couldn't help feeling, while I read this composition over, before sending it by a porter, that it was something in the style of Mr. Micawber. However, I sent it. At night I repaired to Miss Mills's street, and walked up and down until I was stealthily fetched in by Miss Mills's maid, and taken the area away to the back kitchen. I have since reason to believe that there was nothing on earth to prevent my going in at the front door, and being shown up to the drawing-room, except Miss Mills's love of the romantic and mysterious. In the back kitchen I raved as became me. I went there, I suppose, to make a fool of myself, and I am quite sure I did it. Miss Mills had received a hasty note from Dora, telling her that all was discovered, and saying, "'Oh, pray come to me, Julia, do, do!' But Miss Mills, mistrusting the acceptability of her presence to the higher powers, had not yet gone, and we were all benighted in the desert of Sahara. Miss Mills had a wonderful flow of words, and liked to pour them out. I could not help feeling, though she mingled her tears with mine, that she had a dreadful luxury in our afflictions. She petted them, as I may say, and made the most of them. A deep gulf, she observed, had opened between Dora and me, and love could only span it with its rainbow. Love must suffer in this stern world. It ever had been so, and it ever would be so. No matter, Miss Mills remarked, hearts confined by cobwebs would burst at last, and then love was avenged. It was small consolation, but Miss Mills wouldn't encourage fallacious hopes. She made me more wretched than I was before, and I felt, and told her with the deepest gratitude, that she was indeed a friend. We resolved that she should go to Dora the first thing in the morning, and find some means of assuring her, either by looks or words, of my devotion and misery. 
we parted overwhelmed with grief and i think miss mills enjoyed herself completely i confided all to my aunt when i got home and in spite of all she could say to me went to bed despairing i got up despairing and went out despairing it was saturday morning and i went straight to the commons i was surprised when i came within sight of our office door to see the ticket porter standing outside talking together and some half dozen stragglers gazing at the windows which were shut up i quickened my pace and passing among them wondering at their looks went hurriedly in the clerks were there but nobody was doing anything old tiffy for the first time in his life i should think was sitting on somebody else's stool and had not hung up his hat this is a dreadful calamity mr copperfield he said as i entered what is i exclaimed what is the matter don't you know cried tiffy and all the rest of them coming round me no said i looking from face to face mr spenlow said tiffy what about him dead i thought it was the office reeling and not i as one of the clerks caught hold of me they sat me down in a chair untied my neckcloth and brought me some water i have no idea whether this took any time dead said i he dined in town yesterday and drove down in the phaeton by himself said tiffy having sent his own groom home by the coach as he sometimes did you know well the phaeton went home without him the horses stopped at the stable gate the man went out with a lantern nobody in the carriage had they run away they were not hot said tiffy putting on his glasses no hotter i understand than they would have been going down at the usual pace the reins were broken but they had been dragging on the ground the house was roused up directly and three of them went out along the road they found him a mile off more than a mile off mr tiffy interposed the junior was it i believe you are right said tiffy more than a mile off not far from the church lying partly on the roadside and partly on the path upon his face whether he fell out in a fit or got out feeling ill before the fit came on or even whether he was quite dead then though there is no doubt he was quite insensible no one appears to know if he breathed certainly he never spoke medical assistance was got as soon as possible but it was quite useless i cannot describe the state of mind into which i was thrown by this intelligence the shock of such an event happening so suddenly and happening to one with whom i had been in any respect at variance the appalling vacancy in the room he had occupied so lately where his chair and table seemed to wait for him and his handwriting of yesterday was like a ghost the indefinable impossibility of separating him from the place and feeling when the door opened as if he might come in the lazy hush and rest there was in the office and the insatiable relish with which our people talked about it and other people came in and out all day and gorged themselves with the subject this is easily intelligible to any one what i cannot describe is how in the innermost recesses of my own heart i had a lurking jealousy even of death how i felt as if its might would push me from my ground in dora's thoughts how i was in a grudging way i have no words for envious of her grief how it made me restless to think of her weeping to others or being consoled by others how i had a grasping avaricious wish to shut out everybody from her but myself and to be all in all to her at that unreasonable time of all times in the trouble of this state of mind not exclusively my own i hope but known to others i went down to norwood that night and finding from one of the servants when i made my inquiries at the door that miss mills was there got my aunt to direct a letter to her which i wrote i deplored the untimely death of mr spenlow most sincerely and shed tears in doing so i entreated her to tell dora if dora were in a state to hear it that he had spoken to me with the utmost kindness and consideration and had coupled nothing but tenderness not a single or reproachful word with her name i know i did this selfishly to have my name brought before her but i tried to believe it was an act of justice to his memory perhaps i did believe it my aunt received a few lines next day in reply addressed outside to her within to me dora was overcome by grief and when her friend asked her should she send her love to me had only cried as she was always crying oh dear papa oh poor papa but she had not said no and that i made the most of uh, mr jorkins who had been at norwood since the occurrence came to the office a few days afterwards he and tiffy were closeted together for some few minutes and then tiffy looked out at the door and beckoned me in oh 
said Mr. Jorkins. Mr. Tiffy and myself, Mr. Copperfield, are about to examine the desks, the drawers, and other such repositories of the deceased, with a view of sealing up his private papers and searching for a will. There is no trace of any elsewhere. It may be as well for you to assist us, if you please. I had been in agony to obtain some knowledge of the circumstances in which my Dora would be placed, as, in whose guardianship, and so forth, and this was something towards it. We began to search at once, Mr. Jorkins unlocking the drawers and desks, and we all taking out the papers. The office papers we placed on one side, and the private papers, which were not numerous, on the other. We were very grave, and when we came to a stray seal, or pencil case, or ring, or any little article of that kind which we associated personally with him, we spoke very low. We had sealed up several packets, and were still going on dustily and quietly, when Mr. Jorkins said to us, applying exactly the same words to his late partner, as his late partner had applied to him, uh, Mr. Spenlow was very difficult to move from the beaten track. You know what he was. I am disposed to think he had made no will. Oh, I know he had, said I. They both stopped and looked at me. On the very day when I last saw him, said I, he told me that he had, and that his affairs were long since settled. Mr. Jorkins and old Tiffy shook their heads with one accord. "'That looks unpromising,' said Tiffy. "'Very unpromising,' said Mr. Jorkins. "'Surely you don't doubt,' I began. "'My good Mr. Copperfield,' said Tiffy, laying his hand upon my arm and shutting up both his eyes as he shook his head, "'if you had been in the Commons as long as I have, you would know that there is no subject on which men are so inconsistent, and so little to be trusted.' "'Why, bless my soul, he made that very remark,' I replied persistently. "'I should call that almost final,' observed Tiffy. "'My opinion is, no will.' It appeared a wonderful thing to me, but it turned out that there was no will. He had never so much as thought of making one, so far as his papers afforded any evidence, for there was no kind of hint, sketch, or memorandum of any testamentary intention whatever.' what was scarcely less astonishing to me was that his affairs were in a most disordered state it was extremely difficult i heard to make out what he owed or what he had paid or of what he died possessed it was considered likely that for years he could have had no clear opinion on these subjects himself by little and little it came out that in the competition on all points of appearance and gentility then running high in the commons he had spent more than his professional income which was not a very large one and had reduced his private means if they ever had been great which was exceedingly doubtful to a very low ebb indeed there was a sale of the furniture and lease at norwood and tiffy told me little thinking how interested i was in the story that paying all the debts of the deceased and deducting his share of outstanding bad and doubtful debts due to the firm he wouldn't give a thousand pounds for all the assets remaining this was at the expiration of about six weeks i had suffered tortures all the time and thought i really must have laid violent hands upon myself when miss mill still reported to me that my broken-hearted little dora would say nothing when i was mentioned but oh poor papa oh dear papa also that she had no other relations than two aunts maiden sisters of mr spenlow who lived at putney and who had not held any other than chance communications with her brother for many years not that they had ever quarrelled miss mills informed me but that having been on the occasion of dora's christening invited to tea when they considered themselves privileged to be invited to dinner they had expressed their opinion in writing that it was better for the happiness of all parties that they should stay away since which they had gone their road and their brother had gone his these two ladies now emerged from their retirement and proposed to take dora to live at putney dora clinging to them both and weeping exclaimed oh yes aunts please take julia mills and me and jip to putney and so they went very soon after the funeral how i found time to haunt putney i am sure i don't know but i contrived by some means or other to prowl about that neighbourhood pretty often miss mills for the more exact discharge of the duties of friendship kept a journal and she used to meet me sometimes on the common and read it or if she had not time to do that lend it to me how I treasured up the entries, of which I subjoin a sample. Monday. My sweet D still much depressed. Headache. Called attention to J as being beautifully sleek. D fondled J. Associations thus awakened opened floodgates of sorrow. Rush of grief admitted. Are tears the dewdrops of the heart? J. M. 
Tuesday. D. Weak and nervous. Beautiful in pallor. Do we not remark this in the moon likewise? J. M. D. J. M. and J. took airing in carriage. J. looking out of window and barking violently at dustman, occasioned smile to overspread features of D. Of such slight links is chain of life composed? J. M. Wednesday. D. comparatively cheerful. Sang to her as congenial melody, evening bells. Effect not soothing, but reverse. D. inexpressibly affected. Found sobbing afterwards in own room. Quoted verses respecting self and young gazelle, ineffectually. Also referred to patience on monument. Query. Why on monument? J. M. Thursday. D. certainly improved. Better night. Slight tinge of damask revisiting cheek. Resolved to mention name of D. C introduced same cautiously in course of airing d immediately overcome oh dear dear julia oh i have been a naughty and undutiful child soothed and caressed drew ideal picture of d c on verge of tomb d again overcome oh what shall i do what shall i do oh take me somewhere much alarmed fainting of d and glass of water from public house uh, poetical affinity checkered sign on doorpost checkered human life alas J. M. Friday, day of incident, man appears in kitchen with blue bag, for ladies' boots left out to heel. Cook replies, no such orders. Man argues point. Cook withdraws to inquire, leaving man alone with J. On Cook's return, man still argues point, but ultimately goes. J. missing. D. distracted. Information sent to police. Man to be identified by broad nose and legs like balustrades of bridge. Search made in every direction. No J. D. weeping bitterly and inconsolable. Renewed reference to young gazelle. Appropriate but unavailing. Towards evening strange boy calls. Brought into parlour. Broad nose but no balustrades. Says he wants a pound and knows dog. Declines to explain further, though much pressed. Pound being produced by D. takes Cook to little house, where J. alone tied up to leg of table. Joy of D. who dances round J. while he eats his supper. Emboldened by this happy change, mention D. C. upstairs. D. weeps afresh, cries piteously. Oh, don't, don't, don't! It is so wicked to think of anything but poor papa. Embraces J. and sobs herself to sleep. Must not D. C. confine himself to the broad pinions of time? J. M. Miss Mills and her journal were my sole consolation at this period. To see her, who had seen Dora but a little while before, to trace the initial letter of Dora's name through her sympathetic pages, to be made more and more miserable by her, were my only comforts. I felt as if I had been living in a palace of cards, which had tumbled down, leaving only Miss Mills and me among the ruins. I felt as if some grim enchanter had drawn a magic circle round the innocent goddess of my heart which nothing indeed but those same strong pinions capable of carrying so many people over so much would enable me to enter end of chapter thirty eight nine of david copperfield this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ty Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter thirty nine Wickfield and Heap My aunt, beginning I imagined to be made seriously uncomfortable by my prolonged dejection, made a pretence of being anxious that I should go to Dover, to see that all was working well at the cottage which was let, and to conclude an agreement with the same tenant for a longer term of occupation. Janet was drafted into the service of Mrs. Strong, where I saw her every day she had been undecided on leaving dover whether or no to give the finishing touch to that renunciation of mankind in which she had been educated by marrying a pilot but she decided against that venture not so much for the sake of principle i believe as because she happened not to like him although it required an effort to leave miss mills i fell rather willingly into my aunt's pretence as a means of enabling me to pass a few tranquil hours with agnes I consulted the good doctor relative to an absence of three days, and the doctor, wishing me to take that relaxation, he wished me to take more, but my energy could not bear it, I made up my mind to go. As to the commons, I had no great occasion to be particular about my duties in that quarter. To say the truth, we were getting on in no very good order among the tip-top proctors, and were rapidly sliding down to but a doubtful position. 
The business had been indifferent under Mr. Jorkins before Mr. Spenlow's time, and although it had been quickened by the infusion of new blood and by the display which Mr. Spenlow made, still it was not established on a sufficiently strong basis to bear, without being shaken, such a blow as the sudden loss of its active manager. It fell off very much. Mr. Jorkins, notwithstanding his reputation in the firm, was an easy-going and capable sort of man, whose reputation out of doors was not calculated to back it up. I was turned over to him now, and when I saw him take his snuff and let the business go, I regretted my aunt's thousand pounds more than ever. But this was not the worst of it. There were a number of hangers-on and outsiders about the commons, who, without being proctors themselves, dabbled in common form business, and got it done by real proctors who lent their names in consideration of a share in the spoil. And there were a good many of these, too. As our house now wanted business on any terms, we joined this noble band, and threw out lures to the hangers-on and outsiders to bring their business to us. Marriage licences and small probates were what we all looked for, and what paid us best, and the competition for these ran very high indeed. Kidnappers and inveiglers were planted in all the avenues and entrances to the commons, with instructions to do their utmost to cut off all persons in mourning, and all gentlemen with anything bashful in their appearance, and entice them to the offices in which their respective employers were interested. Which instructions were so well observed, that I myself, before I was known by sight, was twice hustled into the premises of our principal opponent. The conflicting interests of these touting gentlemen being of a nature to irritate their feelings, personal collisions took place, and the commons was even scandalised by our principal inveigler, who had formerly been in the wine trade and afterwards in the sworn brokery line, walking about for some days with a black eye. Any one of these scouts used to think nothing of politely assisting an old lady in black out of a vehicle, killing any proctor whom she inquired for, representing his employer as the lawful successor and representative of that proctor, and bearing the old lady off, sometimes greatly affected, to his employer's office. Many captives were brought to me in this way. As to marriage licences, the competition rose to such a pitch that a shy gentleman in want of one had nothing to do but submit himself to the first inveigler, or be fought for and become the prey of the strongest. One of our clerks, who was an outsider, used in the height of this contest to sit with his hat on, that he might be ready to rush out and swear before a surrogate any victim who was brought in. The system of inveigling continues, I believe, to this day. The last time I was in the Commons, a civil, able-bodied person in a white apron pounced out upon me from a doorway, and, whispering the word, marriage licence, in my ear, was with great difficulty prevented from taking me up in his arms and lifting me into a proctor's. From this digression, let me proceed to Dover. I found everything in a satisfactory state at the cottage, and was able to gratify my aunt exceedingly by reporting that the tenant inherited her feud, and waged incessant war against donkeys. Having settled the little business I had to transact there, and slept there one night, I walked on to Canterbury early in the morning. It was now winter again, and the fresh, cold, windy day and the sweeping downland brightened up my hopes a little. Coming into Canterbury, I loitered through the old streets with a sober pleasure that calmed my spirits and eased my heart. There were the old signs, the old names over the shops, the old people serving in them. It appeared so long since I had been a schoolboy there, that I wondered the place was so little changed, until I reflected how little I was changed myself. Strange to say, that quiet influence which was inseparable in my mind from Agnes seemed to pervade even the city where she dwelt. The venerable cathedral towers and the old jackdaws and rooks, whose airy voices made them more retired than perfect silence would have done. The battered gateways, one stuck full with statues, long thrown down and crumbled away, like the reverential pilgrims who had gazed upon them. The still nooks, where the ivied growth of centuries crept over gabled ends and ruined walls, the ancient houses, the pastoral landscape of field, orchard and garden. Everywhere, on everything, I felt the same serener air, the same calm, thoughtful, softening spirit. Arrived at Mr. Wickfield's house, I found in the little lower room on the ground floor, where Uriah Heep had been of old accustomed to sit, Mr. Micawber plying his pen with great assiduity. He was dressed in a legal-looking suit of black, and loomed burly and large in that small office. Mr. Micawber was extremely glad to see me, but a little confused, too. He would have conducted me immediately into the presence of Uriah, but I declined. 
I know the house of old, you recollect, said I, and will find my way upstairs. How do you like the law, Mr. Micawber? My dear Copperfield, he replied, to a man possessed of the higher imaginative powers, the objection to legal studies is the amount of detail which they involve. Even in our professional correspondence, said Mr. Micawber, glancing at some letters he was writing, the mind is not at liberty to soar to any exalted form of expression. Still, it is a great pursuit, a great pursuit. He then told me that he had become the tenant of Uriah Heep's old house, and that Mrs. Micawber would be delighted to receive me once more under her own roof. "'It is humble,' said Mr. Micawber, to quote a favourite expression of my friend Heep, uh, but it may prove the stepping-stone to more ambitious domiciliary accommodation. I asked him whether he had reason so far to be satisfied with his friend Heep's treatment of him. He got up to ascertain if the door were closed shut, before he replied in a lower voice, oh, "'My dear Copperfield, a man who labours under the pressure of pecuniary embarrassments is, with a generality of people, not a disadvantage. Oh, that disadvantage is not diminished when that pressure necessitates the drawing of stipendary emoluments before those emoluments are strictly due and payable. All I can say is that my friend Heep has responded to appeals, to which I need not more particularly refer, in a manner calculated to redound equally to the honour of his head and of his heart. I should not have supposed him to be very free with his money, either, I observed. Oh, pardon me, said Mr. Micawber, with an air of constraint. I speak of my friend Heep as I have experience. I am glad your experience is so favourable, I returned. "'You are very obliging, my dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, and hummed a tune. "'Do you see much of Mr. Wickfield?' I asked, to change the subject. "'Not much,' said Mr. Micawber, slightingly. Uh, "'Mr. Wickfield is, I dare say, a man of very excellent intentions, but he is, in short, he is obsolete.' "'I am afraid his partner seeks to make him so,' said I. "'My dear Copperfield,' returned Mr. Micawber, after some uneasy evolutions on a stool, "'allow me to offer a remark. I am here in a capacity of confidence. I am here in a position of trust. The discussion of some topics, even with Mrs. Micawber herself, so long the partner of my various vicissitudes and a woman of a remarkable lucidity of intellect, is, I am led to consider, incompatible with the functions now devolving on me.' I would therefore take the liberty of suggesting that, in our friendly intercourse, which I trust will never be disturbed, we draw a line. On one side of this line, said Mr. Micawber, representing it on the desk with the office ruler, is the whole range of the human intellect, with a trifling exception. On the other is that exception, that is to say, the affairs of Messrs. Wickfield and Heap, with all belonging and appertaining thereunto. I trust I give no offence to the companion of my youth in submitting this proposition to his cooler judgment. Though I saw an uneasy change in Mr. Micawber, which sat tightly on him, as if his new duties were a misfit, I felt I had no right to be offended. My telling him so appeared to relieve him, and he shook hands with me. I am charmed, Copperfield, said Mr. Micawber, let me assure you, with Miss Wickfield. She is a very superior young lady, of very remarkable attractions, graces, and virtues. Upon my honour, said Mr. Micawber, indefinitely kissing his hand and bowing with his genteelest air, I do homage to Miss Wickfield. Ahem. I am glad of that, at least, said I. "'If you had not assured us, my dear Copperfield, on the occasion of that agreeable afternoon we had the happiness of passing with you, oh, that D was your favourite letter,' said Mr. Micawber, "'I should unquestionably have supposed that A had been so.' "'We have all some experience of a feeling that comes over us occasionally, of what we are saying and doing having been said and done before, in a remote time, of our having been surrounded, dim ages ago, by the same faces, objects, and circumstances, of our knowing perfectly what will be said next, as if we suddenly remembered it. I never had this mysterious impression more strongly in my life than before he uttered those words. I took my leave of Mr. Micawber for the time, charging him with my best remembrances to all at home. As I left him, resuming his stool and his pen, and rolling his head in his stock to get it into easier writing order, I clearly perceived that there was something interposed between him and me, since he had come into his new functions, which prevented our getting at each other as we used to do, and quite altered the character of our intercourse. 
There was no one in the quaint old drawing-room, though it presented tokens of Mrs. Heep's whereabouts. I looked into the room still belonging to Agnes, and saw her sitting by the fire, at a pretty old-fashioned desk she had, writing. My darkening the light made her look up. What a pleasure to be the cause of that bright change in her attentive face, and the object of that sweet regard and welcome. "'Ah, Agnes,' said I, when we were sitting together, side by side, "'I have missed you so much lately.' indeed she replied again and so soon i shook my head i don't know how it is agnes i seem to want some faculty of mind that i ought to have you were so much in the habit of thinking for me in the happy old days here and i came so naturally to you for counsel and support that i really think i have missed acquiring it and what is it said agnes cheerfully i don't know what to call it i replied i think i am earnest and persevering i am sure of it said Agnes. "'And patient, Agnes?' I inquired with a little hesitation. "'Yes,' returned Agnes, laughing. "'Pretty well.' "'And yet,' said I, "'I get so miserable and worried, and am so unsteady and irresolute in my power of assuring myself, uh, that I know I must want—shall I call it—reliance of some kind?' Uh, "'Call it so, if you will,' said Agnes. "'Well,' I returned, "'see here. You come to London, I rely on you, and I have an object and a course at once. I am driven out of it, I come here, and in a moment I feel an altered person. The circumstances that distress me are not changed, since I came into this room, but an influence comes over me in that short interval that alters me, oh, how much for the better. What is it? What is your secret, Agnes? Her head was bent down, looking at the fire. It's the old story, said I. Don't laugh when I say it was always the same in little things as it is in greater ones. My old troubles were nonsense, and now they are serious. But whenever I have gone away from my adopted sister, Agnes looked up with such a heavenly face, and gave me her hand, which I kissed. Whenever I have not had you, Agnes, to advise and approve in the beginning, I have seemed to go wild and to get into all sorts of difficulty. When I have come to you at last, as I have always done, I have come to peace and happiness. I come home now, like a tired traveller, and find such a blessed sense of rest. I felt so deeply what I said, it affected me so sincerely, that my voice failed, and I covered my face with my hand, and broke into tears. I write the truth, whatever contradictions and inconsistencies there were within me, and there are within so many of us, whatever might have been so different, and so much better, whatever I had done, in which I had perversely wandered away from the voice of my own heart, I knew nothing of. I only knew that I was fervently in earnest, and I felt the rest and peace of having Agnes near me. In her placid sisterly manner, with her beaming eyes, with her tender voice, and with that sweet composure which had long ago made the house that held her quite a sacred place to me, she soon won me from this weakness, and led me on to tell all that had happened since our last meeting. "'And there is not another word to tell, Agnes,' said I, when I had made an end of my confidence. "'And now my reliance is on you.' "'But it must not be on me, Trotwood,' returned Agnes, with a pleasant smile. "'It must be on someone else.' "'On Dora,' said I. "'Assuredly.' "'Why, I have not mentioned Agnes,' said I, a little embarrassed. "'That Dora is rather difficult to, I would not for the world say, to rely upon, because she is the soul of purity and truth, but rather difficult to. I hardly know how to express it, really, Agnes. She is a timid little thing, and easily disturbed and frightened.' Some time ago, before her father's death, when I thought it right to mention to her, but I'll tell you, if you will bear with me, how it was. Accordingly, I told Agnes about my declaration of poverty, about the cookery book, the housekeeping accounts, and all the rest of it. Oh, Trotwood, she remonstrated with a smile, just your old headlong way. You might have been in earnest in striving to get on in the world without being so very sudden with a timid, loving, inexperienced girl. Poor Dora! I never heard such sweet forbearing kindness expressed in a voice as she expressed in making this reply. It was as if I had seen her admiringly and tenderly embracing Dora, and tacitly reproving me by her considerate protection, for my hot haste in fluttering that little heart. It was as if I had seen Dora, in all her fascinating artlessness, caressing Agnes and thanking her, and coaxingly appealing against me and loving me with all her childish innocence. I felt so grateful to Agnes, and admired her so. I saw those two together in a bright perspective, such well-associated friends, each adorning the other so much. "'What ought I to do then, Agnes?' 
I inquired after looking at the fire a little while, what would it be right to do? I think, said Agnes, that the honourable course to take would be to write to those two ladies. Don't you think that any secret course is an unworthy one? Yes, if you think so, said I. I am poorly qualified to judge of such matters, replied Agnes, with a modest hesitation, but I certainly feel, in short, I feel that your being secret and clandestine is not being like yourself. Like myself, in the too high opinion you have of me, Agnes, I am afraid, said I. Like yourself, in the candour of your nature, she returned, and therefore I would write to those two ladies would relate as plainly and as openly as possible all that has taken place, and I would ask their permission to visit sometimes at their house. Considering that you are young and striving for a place in life, I think it would be well to say that you would readily abide by any conditions they might impose upon you. I would entreat them not to dismiss your request without a reference to Dora, and to discuss it with her when they should think the time suitable. I would not be too vehement, said Agnes gently, or propose too much. I would trust to my fidelity and perseverance, and to Dora. But if they were to frighten Dora again, Agnes, by speaking to her, said I, and if Dora were to cry and say nothing about me. Is that likely? inquired Agnes, with the same sweet consideration in her face. God bless her! She is as easily scared as a bird, said I. It might be, or if the two Miss Spenlows, elderly ladies of that sort, or odd characters sometimes, should not be likely persons to address in that way. I don't think, Trotwood, returned Agnes, raising her soft eyes to mine. I would consider that. Perhaps it would be better only to consider whether it is right to do this, and if it is, to do it. I had no longer any doubt on the subject. With a lightened heart, though with a profound sense of the weighty importance of my task, I devoted the whole afternoon to the composition of the draft of this letter, for which great purpose Agnes relinquished her desk to me. But first I went downstairs to see Mr. Wickfield and Uriah Heep. I found Uriah in possession of a new plaster-smelling office, built out in the garden, looking extraordinarily mean, in the midst of a quantity of books and papers. He received me in his usual fawning way, and pretended not to have heard of my arrival from Mr. Micawber, a pretence I took the liberty of disbelieving. He accompanied me into Mr. Wickfield's room, which was the shadow of its former self. Having been divested of a variety of conveniences for the accommodation of the new partner, and stood before the fire warming his back and shaving his chin with his bony hand, while Mr. Wickfield and I exchanged greetings. "'You stay with us, Trotwood, while you remain in Canterbury,' said Mr. Wickfield, not without a glance at Uriah for his approval. "'Is there room for me?' said I. "'I am sure, Master Copperfield, I should say, Mister, but the other comes so natural,' said Uriah. "'I would turn out of your old room with pleasure if it would be agreeable.' "'Oh, no, no,' said Mr. Wickfield. "'Why should you be inconvenienced? There's another room, there's another room.' "'Oh, but you know,' returned Uriah with a grin, "'I really would be delighted.' To cut the matter short, I said I would have the other room or none at all. So it was settled that I should have the other room, and, taking my leave of the firm until dinner, I went upstairs again. I had hoped to have no other companion than Agnes, but Mrs. Heep had asked permission to bring herself and her knitting near the fire in that room, on pretence of its having an aspect more favourable for her rheumatics, as the wind was then, than the drawing-room or dining parlour though i could almost have consigned her to the mercies of the wind on the topmost pinnacle of the cathedral without remorse i made a virtue of necessity and gave her a friendly salutation i am humbly thankful to you sir said mrs heep in acknowledgment of my inquiries concerning her health but i'm only pretty well i haven't much to boast of if i could see my uriah well settled in life i couldn't expect much more i think how do you think my yuri looking sir I thought him looking as villainous as ever, and I replied that I saw no change in him. "'Oh, don't you think he's changed?' said Mrs. Heep. "'There I must humbly beg leave to differ from you. Don't you see a thinness in him?' "'Not more than usual,' I replied. "'Don't you, though?' said Mrs. Heep. "'But you don't take notice of him with a mother's eye.' His mother's eye was an evil eye to the rest of the world, I thought, as it met mine, however so affectionate to him and i believe she and her son were devoted to one another it passed me and went on to agnes don't you see a wasting and a wearing in a miss wickfield inquired mrs heep 
no said agnes quietly pursuing the work on which she was engaged you are too solicitous about him he is very well mrs heep with a prodigious sniff resumed her knitting she never left off or left us for a moment i had arrived early in the day and we had still three or four hours before dinner but she sat there plying her knitting needles as monotonously as an hourglass might have poured out its sands she sat on one side of the fire i sat at the desk in front of it a little beyond me on the other side sat agnes whensoever slowly pondering over my letter i lifted up my eyes and meeting the thoughtful face of agnes saw a clear and beam encouragement upon me with its own angelic expression i was conscious presently of the evil eye passing me and going on to her and coming back to me again and dropping furtively upon the knitting what the knitting was i don't know not being learned in that art but it looked like a net and as she worked away with those chinese chopsticks of knitting needles she showed in the firelight like an ill-looking enchantress balked as yet by the radiant goodness opposite but getting ready for a cast of her net by and by at dinner she maintained her watch with the same unwinking eyes after dinner her son took his turn and when mr wickfield himself and i were alone together leered at me and writhed until i could hardly bear it in the drawing-room there was the mother knitting and watching again all the time that agnes sang and played the mother sat at the piano once she asked for a particular ballad which she said her yuri who was yawning in a great chair doted on and at intervals she looked round at him and reported to agnes that he was in raptures with the music but she hardly ever spoke a question if she ever did without making some mention of him it was evident to me that this was the duty assigned to her this lasted until bedtime to have seen the mother and son like two great bats hanging over the whole house and darkening it with their ugly forms made me so uncomfortable that i would rather have remained downstairs knitting and all than gone to bed I hardly got any sleep. Next day the knitting and watching began again, and lasted all day. I had not an opportunity of speaking to Agnes for ten minutes. I could barely show her my letter. I proposed to her to walk out with me, but Mrs. Heep repeatedly complaining that she was worse, Agnes charitably remained within, to bear her company. Towards the twilight I went out by myself, musing on what I ought to do, and whether I was justified on withholding from Agnes any longer what Uriah Heep had told me in London, for that began to trouble me again very much. I had not walked out far enough to be quite clear of the town, upon the Ramsgate Road, where there was a good path, when I was hailed through the dust by someone behind me. The shambling figure and the scanty greatcoat were not to be mistaken. I stopped, and Uriah Heep came up well said i how fast you walk he said my legs are pretty long but you've given them quite a job where are you going said i i'm going with you master copperfield if you'll allow me the pleasure of a walk with an old acquaintance saying this with a jerk of his body which might have been either propitiatory or derisive he fell into step beside me uriah said i as civilly as i could after a silence master copperfield said uriah to tell you the truth at which you will not be offended i came out to walk alone because i have had so much company he looked at me sideways and said with his hardest grin you mean mother why yes i do said i ah but you know we are so very amble he returned and having such a knowledge of our own ambleness, we must really take care that we are not pushed to the wall by them as isn't amble. Old stratagems are fair in love, sir. Raising his great hands until they touched his chin, he rubbed them softly and softly chuckled, looking as like a malevolent baboon, I thought, as any human could. You see, he said, still hugging himself in that unpleasant way and shaking his head at me, you are quite a dangerous rival, Master Copperfield. You always was, you know. Do you set a watch upon Miss Wickfield, and make her home no home because of me? said I. Oh, Master Copperfield, those are very harsh words, he replied. Put my meaning into any words you like, said I. You know what it is, Uriah, as well as I do. Oh, no, you must put it into words, he said. Oh, really, I couldn't myself. "'Do you suppose,' said I, constraining myself to be very temperate and quiet with him on account of Agnes, "'that I regard Miss Wickfield otherwise than as a very dear sister?' 
well master copperfield he replied you perceive i am not bound to answer that question you may not you know but then you see you may anything equal to the low cunning of his visage and of his shadowless eyes without the ghost of an eyelash i never saw come then said i for the sake of miss wickfield my agnes he exclaimed with a sickly angular contortion of himself would you be so good as to call her agnes master copperfield for the sake of agnes wickfield heaven bless her thank you for that blessing master copperfield he interposed i will tell you what i should under any other circumstances as soon have thought of telling to jack ketch to who sir said uriah stretching out his neck and shading his ear with his hand to the hangman i returned the most unlikely person i could think of though his own face had suggested the illusion quite as a natural sequence i am engaged to another young lady i hope that contents you upon your soul said uriah i was about indignantly to give my assertion the confirmation he required when he caught hold of my hand and gave it a squeeze oh master copperfield he said if you had only the condescension to return my confidence when i poured out the fullness of my art the night i put you so much out of the way by sleeping before your sitting-room fire i never should have doubted you as it is i'm sure i'll take off mother directly and only too happy i know you'll excuse the precautions of affection won't you what's a pity master copperfield that you didn't condescend to return my confidence i'm sure i gave you every opportunity but you never have condescended to me as much as i could have wished i know you have never liked me as i liked you all this time he was squeezing my hand with his damp fishy fingers while i made every effort i decently could to get it away but i was quite unsuccessful he drew it under the sleeve of his mulberry-coloured greatcoat and i walked on almost upon compulsion arm in arm with him i shall return said uriah by and by wheeling me face about towards the town on which the early moon was now shining silvering the distant windows before we leave the subject you ought to understand said i breaking a pretty long silence that i believe agnes wickfield to be as far above you and as far removed from all your aspirations as that moon herself peaceful ain't she said uriah very now confess master copperfield that you haven't liked me quite as i have liked you all along you've thought me too humble now i shouldn't wonder i am not fond of professions of humility i returned or professions of anything else there now said uriah looking flabby and lead-coloured in the moonlight didn't i know it but how little you think of the rightful humbleness of a person in my situation master copperfield father and me was both brought up at a foundation school for boys and mother she was likewise brought up at a public sort of charitable establishment they thought us all a deal of humbleness not much else that i know of from morning till night we was to be humble to this person and humble to that and to pull off our caps here and to make bows there and always to know our place and abase ourselves before our betters and we had such a lots of betters father got the monitor medal by being humble so did i father got made a sexton by being humble he had the character among the gentlefolks of being such a well-behaved man that they were determined to bring him in be humble uriah says father to me and you'll get on it was what was always being dinned into you and me at school it's what goes down best be humble says father and you'll do and really it ain't done bad it was the first time it had ever occurred to me that this detestable cant of false humility might have originated out of the heap family i had seen the harvest but had never thought of the seed when i was quite a young boy said uriah i got to know what humbleness did and i took to it i ate humble pie with an appetite i stopped at the humble point of my learning and says i old hard when you offered to teach me latin i knew better people like to be above you says father keep yourself down i am very humble to the present moment master copperfield but i've got a little power as he said all this i knew as i saw his face in the moonlight that i might understand he was resolved to recompense himself by using his power i had never doubted his meanness his craft and malice but i fully comprehended now for the first time what a base unrelenting and revengeful spirit must have been engendered by this early and this long suppression 
his account of himself was so far attended with an agreeable result that it led to his withdrawing his hand in order that he might have another hug of himself under the chin once apart from him i was determined to keep apart and we walked back side by side saying very little more by the way whether his spirits were elevated by the communication i had made to him or by his having indulged in this retrospect i don't know but they were raised by some influence he talked more at dinner than was usual with him asked his mother off duty from the moment of our re-entering the house whether he was not growing too old for a bachelor and once looked at agnes so that i would have given all i had for leave to knock him down when we three males were left alone after dinner he got into a more adventurous state he had taken little or no wine and i presume it was the mere insolence of triumph that was upon him flushed perhaps by the temptation my presence furnished to its exhibition I had observed yesterday that he tried to entice Mr. Wickfield to drink, and interpreting the look which Agnes had given me as she went out, had limited myself to one glass, and then proposed that we should follow her. I would have done so again to-day, but Uriah was too quick for me. "'We seldom see our present visitor, sir,' he said, addressing Mr. Wickfield, sitting such a contrast to him at the end of the table. "'And I should propose to give him welcome in another glass or two of wine, if you have no objections. Mr. Copperfield, your health and happiness.' I was obliged to make a show of taking the hand he stretched across to me, and then, with very different emotions, I took the hand of the broken gentleman, his partner. "'Come, fellow partner,' said Uriah, "'if I may take the liberty. Now, suppose you give us something of another appropriate to Copperfield.' I pass over Mr. Whitfield's proposing my aunt, his proposing Mr. Dick, his proposing Doctor's Commons, his proposing Uriah, his drinking everything twice, his consciousness of his own weakness, the ineffectual effort that he made against it, the struggle between his shame in Uriah's deportment and his desire to conciliate him, the manifest exultation with which Uriah twisted and turned, and held him up before me. It made me sick at heart to see, and my hand recoils from writing it. "'Come, fellow partner,' said Uriah at last, "'I'll give you another one, and I humbly ask for bumpers, "'seeing I intend to make it the divinest of her sex.' "'Her father had his empty glass in his hand. "'I saw him set it down, look at the picture she was so like, "'put his hand to his forehead, and shrink back in his elbow-chair. "'I am an humble individual to give you a relf, proceeded Uriah, "'but I admire, adore no physical pain that her father's grey head could have borne i think could have been more terrible to me than the mental endurance i saw compressed now within both his hands agnes said uriah either not regarding him or not knowing what the nature of his action was agnes wickfield is i am safe to say the divinest of her sex may i speak out among friends to be a father is a proud distinction but to be her husband spare me from ever hearing again such a cry as that with which her father rose up from the table what's the matter said uriah turning of a deadly colour you are not gone mad after all mr wickfield i hope if i say of an ambition to make your agnes my agnes i have as good a right to do it as another man i have a better right to do it than any other man I had my arms around Mr. Wickfield, imploring him by everything that I could think of, oftenest of all by his love for Agnes, to calm himself a little. He was mad for the moment, tearing out his hair, beating his head, trying to force me from him, and to force himself from me, not answering a word, not looking at or seeing any one, blindly striving for he knew not what, his face all staring and distorted, a frightful spectacle i conjured him incoherently but in the most impassioned manner not to abandon himself to this wildness but to hear me i besought him to think of agnes to connect me with agnes to recollect how agnes and i had grown up together how i honoured her and loved her how she was his pride and joy i tried to bring her idea before him in any form i even reproached him with not having firmness to spare her the knowledge of a scene such as this I may have effected something, or his wildness may have spent itself, but by degrees he struggled less, and began to look at me, strangely at first, then with recognition in his eyes. At length he said, "'I know, Trotwood, my darling child and you, I know, but look at him!' He pointed to Uriah, pale and glowering in the corner, evidently very much out in his calculations, and taken by surprise. "'Look at my torturer!' he replied before him i have step by step abandoned name and reputation peace and quiet house and home 
I have kept your name and reputation for you, and your peace and quiet, and your house and home too, said Uriah with a sulky, hurry, defeated air of compromise. Don't be foolish, Mr. Wickfield. If I have gone a little beyond what you were prepared for, I can go back, I suppose. There's no harm done. I looked for single motives in every one, said Mr. Wickfield, and I was satisfied I had bound him to me by motives of interest. But see what he is. Oh, see what he is. You had better stop him, Copperfield, if you can, cried Uriah, with his long forefinger pointing towards me. He'll say something presently, mind you. He'll be sorry to have said afterwards, and you'll be sorry to have heard. I'd say anything, cried Mr. Wickfield, with a desperate air. Why should I not be in all the world's power if I am in yours? Mind, I tell you, said Uriah, continuing to warn me. If you don't stop his mouth, you're not his friend. Why should you not be in all the world's power, Mr. Wickfield? Because you have got a daughter. You and me know what we know, don't we? Let sleeping dogs lie. Who wants to rouse them? I don't. Can't you see I am as humble as I can be? I'll tell you, if I've gone too far, I'm sorry. What would you have, sir? Oh, Trotwood, Trotwood, exclaimed Mr. Wickfield, wringing his hands. What have I come down to be since I first saw you in this house? I was on my downward way then, but the dreary, dreary road I have traversed since. Weak indulgence has ruined me. Indulgence in remembrance and indulgence in forgetfulness. My natural grief for my child's mother turned to disease. My natural love for my child turned to disease. I have infected everything I have touched. I have brought misery on what I dearly love I know, you know. I thought it possible that I could truly love one creature in the world, and not love the rest. I thought it possible that I could truly mourn for one creature gone out of the world, and not have some part in the grief of all who mourned. Thus the lessons of my life have been perverted. I have preyed on my own morbid coward heart, and it has preyed on me, sordid in my grief, sordid in my love, sordid in my miserable escape from the darker side of both. Oh, see the ruin I am, and hate me, shun me. He dropped into a chair and weakly sobbed. The excitement into which he had been roused was leaving him. Uriah came out of his corner. I don't know all I have done in my fatuity, said Mr. Wickfield, putting out his hands as if to deprecate my condemnation. He knows best, meaning Uriah Heep, for he has always been at my elbow, whispering me. You see the millstone that he is around my neck? You find him in my house, you find him in my business. You heard him but a little time ago. What need have I to say more? You haven't need to say so much, nor half so much, nor anything at all, observed Uriah, half defiant and half fawning. You wouldn't have tuck it up so if it hadn't been for the wine. You'll think better of it tomorrow, sir. If I have said too much, or more than I meant, what of it? I haven't stood by it. The door opened, and Agnes, gliding in without a vestige of colour in her face, put her arm round his neck, and steadily said, Papa, you are not well. Come with me. He laid his head upon her shoulder, as if he were oppressed with heavy shame, and went out with her. Her eyes met mine but for an instant, yet I saw how much she knew of what had passed. "'I didn't expect he'd cut up so rough, Master Copperfield,' said Uriah. "'But it's nothing. I'll be friends with him to-morrow. It's for his good. I'm humbly anxious for his good.' I gave him no answer, and went upstairs to the quiet room where Agnes had so often sat beside me at my books. Nobody came near me until late at night. I took up a book and tried to read. I heard the clock strike twelve, and was still reading, without knowing what I read, when Agnes touched me. "'You will be going early in the morning, Trotwood. Let us say good-bye now.' She had been weeping, but her face then was so calm and beautiful. "'Heaven bless you,' she said, giving me her hand. Dearest Agnes, I returned, I see you ask me not to speak of tonight, but is there nothing to be done? There is God to trust in, she replied. Can I do nothing, I who come to you with my poor sorrows? And make mine so much lighter, she replied. Dear Trotwood, no. Dear Agnes, said I, it is presumptuous for me, who am so poor in all in which you are so rich, goodness, resolution, all noble qualities, to doubt or direct you. But you know how much I love you, and how much I owe you. You will never sacrifice yourself to a mistaken sense of duty, Agnes." More agitated for a moment than I had ever seen her, she took her hands from me and moved a step back. "'Say you have no such thought, dear Agnes, much more than sister. Think of the priceless gift of such a heart as yours, of such a love as yours.' 
though long long afterwards i saw that face rise up before me with its momentary look not wondering not accusing not regretting oh long long afterwards i saw that look subside as it did now into the lovely smile with which she told me she had no fear for herself i need have none for her and parted from me by the name of brother and was gone it was dark in the morning when i got upon the coach at the inn door the day was just breaking when we were about to start and then as i sat thinking of her came struggling up the coach side through the mingled day and night uriah's head copperfield he said in a croaking whisper as he hung by the iron on the roof i thought you'd be glad to hear before you went off that there's no squares broke between us i've been into his room already and we've made it all smooth why though i'm humble i'm useful to him you know he understands his interest when he isn't in liquor what an agreeable man he is after all master copperfield i obliged myself to say that i was glad he had made his apology oh to be sure said uriah when a person's humble you know what's an apology so easy i say i suppose with a jerk you have sometimes plucked a pear before it was ripe master copperfield i suppose i have i replied i did that last night said uriah but it'll ripen yet it only wants attending to i can wait profuse in his farewells he got down again as the coachman got up for anything i know he was eating something to keep the raw morning air out but he made motions with his mouth as if the pear were ripe already and he were smacking his lips over it End of chapter thirty nine David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter forty. The Wanderer. We had a very serious conversation in Buckingham Street that night about the domestic occurrences I have detailed in the last chapter. My aunt was deeply interested in them and walked up and down the room with her arms folded for more than two hours afterwards whenever she was particularly discomposed she always performed one of these pedestrian feats and the amount of her discomposure might be always estimated by the duration of her walk on this occasion she was so much disturbed in mind as to find it necessary to open the bedroom door and make a course for herself comprising the full extent of the bedrooms from wall to wall and while mr dick and i sat quietly by the fire she kept passing in and out along this measured track at an unchanging pace with the regularity of a clock pendulum when my aunt and i were left to ourselves by mr dick's going out to bed i sat down to write my letter to the two old ladies by that time she was tired of walking and sat by the fire with her dress tucked up as usual but instead of sitting in her usual manner holding her glass upon her knee she suffered it to stand neglected upon the chimney-piece and resting her left elbow on her right arm and her chin on her left hand looked thoughtfully at me as often as i raised my eyes from what i was about i met hers i am in the lovingest of tempers my dear she would assure me with a nod but i am fidgeted and sorry i had been too busy to observe until after she was gone to bed that she had left her night mixture as she always called it untasted on the chimney-piece she came to her door with even more than her usual affection of manner when i knocked to acquaint her with this discovery but only said i have not the heart to take a trot to-night and shook her head and went in again she read my letter to the two old ladies in the morning and approved of it i posted it and had nothing to do then but wait as patiently as i could for the reply I was still in this state of expectation, and had been for nearly a week, when I left the doctor's one snowy night to walk home. It had been a bitter day, and a cutting northeast wind had blown for some time. The wind had gone down with the light, and so the snow had come on. It was a heavy settled fall, I recollect, in great flakes, and it lay thick. The noise of wheels and tread of people were as hushed as if the streets had been strewn that depth with feathers. My shortest way home, and I naturally took the shortest way on such a night, was through St. Martin's Lane. Now the church which gives its name to the lane stood in a less free situation at that time, there being no open space before it, and the lane winding down to the strand. As I passed the steps of the portico I encountered, at the corner, a woman's face. It looked into mine, and passed across the narrow lane and disappeared. 
I knew it. I had seen it somewhere, but I could not remember where. I had some association with it that struck upon my heart directly, but I was thinking of anything else when it came upon me and was confused. On the steps of the church there was the stooping figure of a man who had put down some burden on the smooth snow to adjust it. My seeing the face and my seeing him were simultaneous. I don't think I had stopped in my surprise, but in any case, as I went on, he rose, turned, and came down towards me. I stood face to face with Mr. Peggotty. Then I remembered the woman. It was Martha, to whom Emily had given the money that night in the kitchen. Martha Endell, side by side with whom he would not have seen his dear niece, Ham had told me, for all the treasures wrecked in the sea. We shook hands heartily. At first neither of us could speak a word. "'Master Davy,' he said, gripping me tight, "'it do my heart good to see you, sir. Well met, well met.' "'Well met, my dear old friend,' said I. "'I had my thoughts of coming down to make inquiration for you, sir, to-night,' he said, "'but no one as your aunt was living along with you, for I'd been down yonder, Yarmouth way. I was afeard it was too late. I should have come early in the morning, sir, afore going away.' "'Again?' said I. "'Yes, sir,' he replied, patiently shaking his head. "'I'm away to-morrow.' "'And where are you going now?' I asked. Well, he replied, shaking the snow out of his long hair, I was a-goin' to turn in somewheres. In those days there was a side entrance to the stable-yard of the Golden Cross, the inn so memorable to me in connection with his misfortune, nearly opposite to where we stood. I pointed out the gateway, put my arm through his, and we went across. Two or three public rooms opened out of the stable-yard, and looking into one of them, and finding it empty and a good fire burning, I took him in there. When I saw him in the light I observed not only that his hair was long and ragged, but that his face was burnt dark by the sun. He was greyer, the lines in his face and forehead were deeper, and he had every appearance of having toiled and wandered through all varieties of weather. But he looked very strong, and like a man upheld by steadfastness of purpose, whom nothing could tire out. He shook the snow from his hat and clothes and brushed it away from his face while I was inwardly making these remarks. As he sat down opposite to me at the table, with his back to the door by which we had entered, he put out his rough hand again and grasped mine warmly. "'I tell you, Master Davy,' he said, "'where all I've been and what all we've heard. I've been fur and we've heard little, but I'll tell you.' I rang the bell for something hot to drink. He would have nothing stronger than ale, and while it was being brought and being warmed at the fire he sat thinking. There was a fine mass of gravity in his face I did not venture to disturb. "'When she was a child,' he said, lifting up his head soon after we were left alone, "'she used to talk to me a deal about the sea, and about them coasts where the sea got to be dark blue and to lay a-shining and a-shining in the sun. I thought odd times, as her father being drownded made her think on it so much. I do not know, you see, but maybe she believed or hoped he had drifted out to them parts where the flowers is always a-blowin' and the country bright. It is likely to have been a childish fancy, I replied. When she was lost, said Mr. Peggotty, I knowed in my mind as he would take her to them countries. I knowed in my mind as he'd have told her wonders of them, and how she was to be a lady there, and how he'd got her to listen to him first, along as such like. When we see his mother, I knowed quite as well as I was right. I went across Channel to France, and landed there as if I'd fell down from the sky. I saw the door move, and the snow drift in. I saw it move a little more, and a hand softly interposed to keep it open. I found out an English gentleman as was in authority, said Mr. Peggotty, and told him I was a-going to see my niece. He got me them papers as I wanted for to carry me through. I do and rightly know how they're called, and he would have given me money, but that I was thankful to have no need on. I thank him kind after all he done, I'm sure. I wrote it for you, he says to me, and I shall speak to many as will come that way, and many will know you, far distant from here, when you're a-travelling alone. I told him, best as I was able, what my gratitude was, and went away through France. "'Alone and on foot,' said I. "'Mostly a foot,' he rejoined. "'Sometimes in carts along a people going to market, sometimes in empty coaches. Many mile a day a foot, and often with some poor soldier or another, travelling to see his friends. I couldn't talk to him,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'nor him to me, uh, but we was company for one another, too, along the dusty roads.' I should have known that by his friendly tone. 
when i come to any town he pursued i found the inn and waited about the yard till someone turned up someone mostly did as knowed english then i told them that i was on my way to seek my niece and they told me what manner of gentlefolks was in the house and i waited to see any as seemed like her going in or out when it weren't emily i went on again by little and little when i came to a new village or that among the poor people i found they'd knowed about me they would set me down at their cottage doors and give me what not for to eat and drink and show me where to sleep and many a woman master davy as has had a daughter of about emily's age i found a waiting for me at our saviour's cross outside the village for to do me similar kindnesses some has had daughters as was dead and god only knows how good them mothers was to me it was martha at the door i saw her haggard listening face distinctly my dread was lest he should turn his head and see her too they would often put their children particularly their little girls said mr peggotty upon my knee and many a time you might have seen me sitting at their doors when night was coming in almost as if they'd been my darlin's children oh my darlin overpowered by a sudden grief he sobbed aloud i laid my trembling hand upon the hand he put before his face thank ye sir he said do and take no notice in a very little while he took his hand away and put it on his breast and went on with his story they often walked with me he said in the morning maybe a mile or two upon the road and when we parted and i said i'm very thankful to you god bless you they always seemed to understand and answered pleasant at last i came to the sea it weren't hard you may suppose for a seafarer man like me to work his way over to italy when i got there i wandered on as i had done before and people was just as good to me and i should have gone from town to town maybe the country through but that i got news of our being seen among them swiss mountains yonder one has noticed servants see them there all three and told me how they travelled and where they was i made for them mountains master davy day and night ever so far i went ever so far the mountains seemed to shift away from me but i came up with them and crossed them and when i got nigh the place as i had been told of i began to think within my own self what shall i do when i see her the listening face insensible to the inclement night still drooped at the door and the hands begged me prayed me not to cast it forth i never doubted her said mr peggotty no not a bit only let her see my face only let her hear my voice only let my stand and still afore her bring to her thoughts the home she had fled away from and the child she had been and if she had grown to be a royal lady she'd have fell down at my feet i knowed it well many a time in my sleep i had heard her cry out uncle and seen her fall like death afore me many a time in my sleep i had raised her up and whispered to her emily my dear i am come for to bring forgiveness and to take you home he stopped and shook his head and went on with a sigh he was now to me now emily was all i bought a country dress to put upon her and i know that once found she would walk beside me over them stony roads go where i would and never never leave me more to put that dress upon her and to cast off what she wore to take her on my arm again and wander towards home to stop sometimes upon the road and heal her bruised feet and her worst bruised heart was all that i thought of now i don't believe i should have done so much as to look at him but master davy it weren't to be not yet i was too late and they were gone where i couldn't learn some said here some said there i travelled here and i travelled there but i found no emily and i travelled home how long ago i asked a matter of four days said mr peggotty i sighted the old boat after dark and the light a shining in the window when i came nigh and looked in through the glass i see the faithful creature mrs gummidge sitting by the fire as we had fixed upon alone i called out don't be afeard it's dan'l and i went in i never could have thought the old boat could have been so strange from some pocket in his breast he took out with a very careful hand a small paper bundle containing two or three letters or little packets which he laid upon the table this fust one come he said selecting it from the rest afore i had been gone a week a fifty pound bank note and a sheet of paper directed to me and put underneath the door in the night she tried to hide her writing but she couldn't hide it from me he folded up the note again with great patience and care in exactly the same form and laid it on one side this came to mrs gummidge 
he said, opening another, two or three months ago. After looking at it for some moments, he gave it to me, and added in a low voice, Be so good as read it, sir. I read as follows. Oh, what you will feel when you see this writing, and know it comes from my wicked hand. But try, try, not for my sake, but for uncle's goodness. Try to let your heart soften to me only for a little, little time. Try, pray do, to relent towards a miserable girl, and write down on a bit of paper whether he is well, and what he said about me before you left off ever naming me among yourselves, and whether of a night, when it is my old time of coming home, you ever see him look as if he thought of one he used to love so dear. Oh, my heart is breaking when I think about it. I am kneeling down to you, begging and praying you not to be as hard with me as I deserve, as I well, well know I deserve, but to be so gentle and so good as to write down something of him and to send it to me. You need not call me little, and you need not call me by the name I have disgraced, but, oh, listen to my agony, and have mercy on me so far as to write some word of uncle, never, never to be seen in this world by my eyes again. Dear, if your heart is hard towards me, justly hard, I know, but listen, if it is hard, dear, ask him I have wronged the most, him whose wife I was to have been, before you quite decide against my poor, poor prayer. If he should be so compassionate as to say that you might write something for me to read, I think he would, oh, I think he would, if you would only ask him, for he always was so brave and so forgiving. Tell him then, but not else, that when I hear the wind blowing at night, I feel as if it was passing angrily from seeing him and uncle, and was going up to God against me. Tell him that if I was to die to-morrow, and oh, if I was fit, I would be so glad to die. I would bless him and uncle with my last words, and pray for his happy home with my last breath. Some money was enclosed in this letter also, five pounds. It was untouched, like the previous sum, and he refolded it in the same way. Detailed instructions were added relative to the address of a reply which, though they betrayed the intervention of several hands, and made it difficult to arrive at any very probable conclusion in reference to her place of concealment, made it at least not unlikely that she had written from that spot where she was stated to have been seen. "'What answer was sent?' I inquired of Mr. Peggotty. "'Mrs. Gummidge,' he returned, "'not being a good scholar, sir, Ham kindly drawed it out, and she made a copy on it. They told her I was gone to seek her, and what my parting words was.' "'Is that another letter in your hand?' said I. "'It's money, sir,' said Mr. Peggotty, unfolding it a little way. Ten pound, you see, and wrote inside from a true friend, like the first. But the first was put underneath the door, and this come by the post, day afore yesterday. I'm a-going to seek her at the postmark.' He showed it to me. It was a town on the Upper Rhine. He had found out at Yarmouth some foreign dealers who knew that country, and they had drawn him a rude map on paper, which he could very well understand. He laid it between us on the table, and, with his chin resting on one hand, tracked his course upon it with the other. I asked him how Ham was. He shook his head. "'He works,' he said, "'as bold as a man can. His name's as good in all them parts as any man's is anywheres in the world.' Anyone's hand is ready to help him, you understand, and his is ready to help them. He's never been heard for to complain, but my sister's belief is, twixt ourselves, as it has cut him deep. Poor fellow, I can believe it. He ain't no care, Master Davy, said Mr. Peggotty in a solemn whisper. Kinder no care no how for his life. When a man's wanted for rough service in rough weather, he's there. And when there's hard duty to be done with danger in it, he steps forward to fall all his mates. And yet he's as gentle as any child. There ain't a child in Yarmouth that doant know him. He gathered up the letters thoughtfully, smoothing them with his hand, put them into their little bundle, and placed it tenderly in his breast again. The face was gone from the door. I still saw the snow drifting in, but nothing else was there. Well, he said, looking into his bag, I haven't seen you to-night, Master Davy, and that does me good. I shall away be times to-morrow morning. You've seen what I've got here, putting his hand on where the little packet lay. All that troubles me is to think that any harm might come to me afore that money was give back. If I was to die, and if it was lost or stole or elseways made away with, and it was never known by him but what I took it, I believe t'other world wouldn't hold me. I believe I must come back. He rose, and I rose too. We grasped each other by the hand again before going out. 
I go ten thousand mile, he said. I go till I drop dead to lay that money down afore him. If I do that and find my Emily, I'm content. If I do and find her, maybe she'll come to here some time as her loving uncle only ended his search for her when he ended his life. And if I know her, even that'll turn her home at last. As he went out into the rigorous night, I saw the lonely figure flit away before us. I turned him hastily on some pretense, and held him in conversation until it was gone. He spoke of a traveller's house on the Dover Road, where he knew he could find a clean, plain lodging for the night. I went with him over Westminster Bridge, and parted from him on the Surrey shore. Everything seemed, to my imagination, to be hushed in reverence for him, as he resumed his solitary journey through the snow. I returned to the inn-yard, and, impressed by my remembrance of the face, looked awfully around for it. It was not there. The snow had covered our late footprints. My new track was the only one to be seen. And even that began to die away. It snowed so fast, as I looked back over my shoulder. End of chapter 40